we're going to have to rebuild within this wild, wild west of information flow some sort of curating function. It's time for the Access of Easy podcast, the weekly technology digest that keeps you ahead of the curve. We've got to maybe do something with the internet. Brought to you by EasyDNS.com. Somebody will say, oh, freedom of speech, freedom of speech. These are foolish people. Crypto derivatives platform BitMEX has been hit with indictments and arrests. Ontario cops misused a COVID contact tracing database. Hospitals paralyzed in largest healthcare ransomware attack ever. And how India censors the web. Hey everybody, this is Mark Jeftovic with another episode of the Access of Easy Weekly Digest. This is number 166. We're recording this on, what day is it? October the 5th, 2020. The show notes for this week's edition will be up on accessofeasy.com slash 166. Last week's quote was... Persisting social crisis, the emergence of a charismatic personality, and the exploitation of mass media to obtain public confidence would be the stepping stones in the piecemeal transformation of the United States into a highly controlled society. That was former National Security Advisor to Jimmy Carter, Zbigniew Brzezinski. I've never been absolutely sure how to pronounce his first name. He was the author of Between Two Ages, America's Role in the Technotronic Era. That's where the quote came from. What he called technotronic is what we now refer to today as technocracy. That book pretty well lays out the case for an American blueprint of a future technocracy. Nobody got it. I actually had to shut off comments on the blog last week because... We came under attack from some kind of weird comment spammer bot, and I had to just shut it off, but nobody got it after like three quarters of a day, so I figured nobody was going to get it. This week's quote is, journalism possesses in itself the potentiality of becoming one of the most frightful monstrosities and delusions that have ever cursed mankind. This horrible transformation will occur at the exact instant at which journalists realize they can become an aristocracy. You know, the rules, no searching it up online and the first person to post the source of the quote to the show notes page gets their next domain or web hosting renewal on us. So crypto derivatives platform BitMEX has been hit with indictments and an arrest on September 2nd. The U.S. Department of Justice and the CFTC filed indictments against the cryptocurrency derivatives platform BitMEX and its three co-founders. One of them, CTO Samuel Reed, was arrested in Massachusetts, and CEO Arthur Hayes and Ben Delo were outside of the USA at the time, and they remain at large. BitMEX incorporated in the Seashells Islands, and they were trying to avoid U.S. regulations, but the indictments are saying that um, the company was still providing services to U.S. citizens and not undertaking proper KYC and AML, which made them, in the grand scheme of things, a money laundering operation. KYC is know your customer, AML is anti-money laundering. A company spokesman and legal reps say that they deny any wrongdoing and will defend against the charges. And uh, if you want to get the nitty gritty on this, Coindesk's breakdown with NLW had a really great deep dive into it. He had legal experts Stephen Pally and Preston Byrne, and they go over the indictments and the background and what this means for Bitcoin, DeFi, and the crypto space in general. Ontario cops misused a COVID contact tracing database. So two separate civil liberties groups in Canada have issued reports detailing how police in Ontario have misused a COVID contact tracing database to make queries unrelated to active calls. So the Canadian Civil Liberties Association, the CCLA, and the Canadian Constitution Foundation, CCF, have raised the alarm and objected to the database on the grounds that, quote, 
allowing police to access personal health records violated individuals' constitutional rights to privacy and equality. End quote. This database was created pursuant to an emergency order in April that would enable police to obtain names and addresses of Ontarians who had tested positive for COVID, and it was intended to protect first responders. Police conducted over 95,000 searches using this database. The CCF uncovered a memo issued from the Solicitor General to the province's chiefs of police detailing, quote, shocking misuse, end quote, of the system and singling out two police forces in particular, Thunder Bay and Durham County, and the group has lodged a complaint with the Ontario Privacy Commissioner. To both their credit, Toronto Police Services declined to use the database at all due to, quote, issues with the accuracy and reliability of the information, end quote, and York Regional Police directed the province to rescind their access after they did an internal review and they just sniffed trouble and they thought, you know, this could be a privacy problem if we use it, so we're not going to use it. Probably a good call. New phishing worm is one of the most effective business email compromises yet. So these guys are always raising the ante. A security researcher wrote up this description. This attack didn't fit the exact definition of a worm, which spreads without human aid, but the dynamics of the attack were very worm-like. In this case, the attack spread by compromising an account and then sifting through the emails in the vulnerable mailbox and then locating email conversations with multiple recipients, then using the reply to all function in order to follow up on those conversations, directing everybody to follow a link to a spear phishing URL, which would then compromise the next round of people. The viral responses would arrive in the victim's mailboxes and, quote, give every email an inherited sense of trust. You asked for this thing, here it is, link to phishing page, end quote. So the SecOps team dealing with this attack were able to isolate a pattern in the attacker URL to filter on their network edge, and then they enabled two-factor authentication for anybody who did not already have it. Hospitals paralyzed in the largest healthcare ransomware attack ever. So this affected the computer systems of Universal Health Services. It's a publicly traded company, runs approximately 400 hospitals, most of them in the U.S. They began shutting down over the weekend of September 26th. Remember, in Access of Easy 164, we reported on how a ransomware attack on a hospital in Germany resulted in the first known fatality caused by this type of attack. In this case, the hospitals were able to continue operating by falling back to manual methods of paperwork. The primary failure mode seems to be around their medication systems, which are all online. Speaking of outages, the Tokyo Stock Exchange had to halt for an entire trading day back on October 1st. They had a hardware failure that took down the stock exchange completely. It was the first complete failure an entire day of mistrading since the Tokyo Stock Exchange switched over to 100% electronic trading in 1999. The TSE is the world's third largest stock exchange, and they ascribed the outage to a hardware failure in its Arrowhead facility, whatever that is, and that combined with an inability to switch over to their backup systems did the trick. And another outage, this one, a 911 outage hitting 14 U.S. states. This one took down the emergency 911 service across 14 states, including Arizona, California, Colorado, Delaware, Florida, Illinois, Indiana, Minnesota, Nevada, North Carolina, North Dakota, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and Washington State. This one happened on Monday, September 28th. It was originally speculated that it was caused by uh, Microsoft Azure outage, which was having a mega outage at the same time. But then suspicion moved on to a couple of vendors that handle E911 calls for large parts of the US, specifically zeroing in on one of those providers called Intrado, 
who in turn blamed one of their service providers, but they didn't specify who it was or what was the root cause. So Krebs on Security thinks that the service provider in question was another 911 provider called Lumen, whose system status page indicated a complete failure across all systems for the time in question. Lumen, for their part, is blaming Intrado for the outage. Both companies have had issues in the past and they have paid multiple fines and settlements over prior outages, at least Intrado has. How India Censors the Web. This report is from back in January and it was updated in April. It's from India's Center for Internet and Society and it looks at how web censorship is being implemented across that country's various ISPs. In technical terms, they found that different ISPs were using different combinations of different censorship methods, namely DNS, HTTP blocking, and in the case of HTTPS traffic, they were using SNI inspection. SNI is server name identifier that signals to a web server which website uh, HTTPS request is destined for. It's like the HTTP host header for regular traffic. So the data set of blocked sites was compiled from government orders, some of which were leaked, court orders, and crowdsourced from user reports via India's Internet Freedom Foundation. And the results showed that different ISPs have vastly differing block lists and different different methodologies. In one case, one ISP, ACT, was blocking roughly twice as many sites as another ISP, Airtel and it led the study to surmise that there lacked any uniformity in ISP compliance with blocking or unblocking orders from government or courts. And the result is that Indian citizens' experience of web censorship varies widely across the country. Google Play will require all Android apps to use its billing system. This, this one kind of reminds me of Apple's battle with epic games that's going on right now that we started reporting on back in access of easy number 161 google seems to be setting itself up for something similar the company has announced that starting next year all apps in the google play store will have to use google's billing system for in-app purchases for all applications that sell digital services the new policy goes into effect in september 2021 supposedly this gives all the developers time to adapt and then last week on the axis of easy salon, we did number 24. It's not conspiracy, it's culture. We talked about the attention economy and how when we make analogies about some weird bizarro verse somewhere, it never occurs to us that we may be in the bizarro verse. That's it for this week. Stay healthy, stay sane, stay safe, and we will see you all next week. Oh